What is up, YouTube? I wanted to talk to you today about doing remote recording sessions for drums. So for those of you that are newer to remote recording, or you know, maybe this is something that you've been meaning to get into and you just haven't been able to do it and now you have time on your hands, I was actually doing a drum overdub here at the studio and I said, you know what, let me just throw on a camera and kind of walk you through how I think about it. So that's what we're gonna get into today. Now this is just my workflow. This really depends on the drummer and what their role is. It depends on the engineer or the producer you're sending the stems to as to how they want them delivered and how much processing and all of this stuff. But these are the five steps that I take to uh, do drum overdubs. First step in kind of doing drum, remote drum overdubs from your home studio is organizing the session, you know. Um, I prefer artists, engineers, producers, whoever, to send me a two mix, which is basically just like a stereo bounce of the song as it is. And if there are already pre-programmed drums, maybe split those out, drop it in the project, set your DAW BPM to whatever it needs to be, whatever the song is, um, tempo map the song if there's tempo changes. When you're setting up your session, uh, it's really important when you start your session to record at 24 bit depth and 48 hertz, uh, kilohertz sample rate. 24, 48, that's kind of like the industry standard and it's higher than 16 and 44.1. Uh, you can always go down if someone wants to work in 44.1 and 16, you can always go down, but if you don't record at 24.48, you can't go up. So once the project is kind of set up, I have my tempo, I have all that stuff, then I'll drop markers and get a basic uh, kind of flow of the song form. I'll mark, you know, the intro, the verse, the chorus, and as I'm doing this, I might make little notes in the markers of, you know, drums come in here, diamond here, you know, pause here, break, whatever. So that's step one, set up the session and kind of prep the song. Step two is program any kind of programmed drums I'm going to do. So these are, you know, kind of electronic samples or whatever. This isn't what I do on every project, but you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, even though I am, people are primarily hiring me to do acoustic drums, most songs that have acoustic drums also have programmed percussion elements in it. So this is an area where, you know, I will either program or record tambourines. I'll do, you know, if the first verse doesn't have real drums, it has kind of a drum loop vibe thing, I'll program that drum loop vibe. But this is kind of just laying all of the bed work so that when I do record real drums, I kind of have a bigger vision of, okay, the first verse is gonna have this stuff, and that way I can build my real acoustic drum part around whatever I'm gonna program. Step three is track the real drums. So now that the project is set up and I kind of have the program stuff there, I'm gonna sit down and record real drums. So that will be usually one or two passes of the song, then I'll comp one pass together. Most of the producers and engineers and stuff uh, that I work with only want one full pass of drums on the song. Sometimes people send three or four takes and usually what I'll do is maybe I'll give a second kind of playlist for people to comp in maybe different drum fills, but for the most part I kind of want to nail the part and have it comped and you know whatever so that the producer or whoever I'm sending it to doesn't have to like sift through a bunch of takes and pick their favorite. I kind of do that work for them. So this is where I'll sit down and record real drums, I'll get a good take, and then I'll also record any kind of like uh, drum overdub parts, you know, sometimes I want to layer different acoustic drum parts, so sometimes I wanted to have like a kit vibe going on, and then some rumbly muted toms underneath it. So this is where I'll just sit down at the real drums and build out and layer and do a full pass of the song and just kind of get all the real drums recorded. <laughs> 
step four is go ahead and edit the drums. Now everybody has their own opinion about how gridded or, you know, beat detective the drums should sound. Some people don't grid at all. Some people put it all super tight on the grid. I lean toward putting everything kind of really on the grid. Most people in Nashville, you know, when I'm sending files around, a lot of the other parts aren't even recorded. So it's really hard to keep the human feel when I'm not really usually record, usually I'm just recording to like a key a rough keyboard track and then a rough vocal track. And then the producer is kind of coaching me, hey, we want the song to grow here and do this and here are the references. So I kind of grid and button up everything pretty tight because that means that it makes it easier for everybody that's going to track stuff behind me to go and not feel like they have to be so locked into like my human whatever. But that changes from project to project and everybody has a different opinion on that. And I'll also go through and find kick and snare samples. Most of the biggest songs on the radio today, even if they were recorded by an amazing drummer in an amazing studio, the real drums still have samples layered in. So, and a lot of times I do this, I'll find samples I really like for the kick and snare, and then print them throughout the whole song. It makes it easier, you know, I don't send my drums, I don't send them out with all the effects and EQ and compression and all that stuff because that's what a real actual mixing engineer is going to do. And the more mixing I do, the more it kind of ties their hands at what they can do. Um, so instead of doing a bunch of mixing and all of that stuff, a lot of times when I find these kick and snare samples to layer into the sounds that I got, one, it makes the engineer's job way easier because they kind of get a vision for where the drums are going to go because those samples will sound much more mixed and much more um, finalized than the raw drum tracks I send. And two, it makes it easier on the producer or the artist that I'm sending my files to because when I send them the raw drum files, you know, they're not going to have the punch and the crack that they will after they've been mixed. And having these samples in here means that, you know, the drums are gonna have a little more aggression and sound a little more finalized without actually tying the engineer's hand. So it's gonna make the drums kind of sound better, quicker in the interim between me tracking them, sending the raw files in you know, the final mix when the drums are totally polished and mixed you know, to be ready to go to Spotify or wherever it's gonna go. The last thing I'll do in this phase is uh, I will make sure that all of my drum acoustic drum tracks that I just did are in phase. When I'm tracking, I run a plugin that flips the phase, but before I send these tracks, I make sure that I invert the phase on those files so that when I send them, people plug them into their DAW to mix or whatever, and they're all perfectly in phase. I'm gonna send 28 WAV files to the artist that I did these overdubs for today. Some of those are actually stereo files, so it's actually more than 28. It gets to be like close to 40 different files that I'm sending to someone. So before I send all those 40 files, usually what I'll do is I'll make a rough mix of the song with my drums and send it to the artist, producer, engineer that I'm doing the overdubs for and have them kind of okay and say, wow, yeah, that sounds great. That's definitely the right vibe. Once they've okay that kind of rough mix I send them, then I bounce out all of the raw tracks into separate folders. So I'll do a folder for percussion and program stuff, and I'll do a folder for real drums. And this way they don't get confused when they load stuff in because sometimes there's things labeled snare in the programmed drums that I did, and then there's the real snare that I used on my drum kit, and it can get really, really confusing if they're all just jumbled in one file. So it's really, really important to keep this stuff separate and also to name this stuff uh, stuff that makes sense. Please make sure that when you bounce out files, all of your files start from zero. In this song that I just did, the drums actually don't kick in until like the first course. So if I bounce out my wave files of my acoustic drums that I recorded, starting at the first course, well then when I send it to the producer, they open up the folder, they drag those files in, those drums that are supposed to be at the first course are actually starting at the very beginning of the song, which won't make any sense at all. You need to make sure that before, when whatever Pro Tools logic, all of them do it a little bit differently, but please make sure 
that all of your audio files, you know, start at zero and end at the end of the song. And that way, when whoever is going to plug them into their DAW, when they open up their DAW and drag it in, it all starts at zero, everything starts together and ends together and is locked into the right spot. Do not make whoever you're sending the files to hunt around for where, you know, these program samples are supposed to go. All of that should be taken care of if you bounce out the, all of your files from zero. So I organize into folders. I make sure that all of them started at zero so no one's gonna have to hunt for that stuff. And then I take all those folders, zip them up into one neat and nice file. Uh, it's a dot, dot .zip file. And then I will upload that to Dropbox, send them a clean Dropbox link. So that's it. That's the whole process.